Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to study together the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit use these things to help us to appreciate all that you've provided for us in your matchless grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Cheryl Lyons was discharged from the hospital last night, uh, much sooner than we all anticipated, uh, and uh, really surprised to get the call to say that she was home already. And uh, so I'll be praying for her, and remember to pray as Gary Horton prepares to come October 8th and 9th, and on the Thursday night, the 8th, he'll be here at, uh, for a spaghetti supper for everybody, and then uh, we are, want you to be here to encourage and to be listening to Gary as he presents something, particularly, we hope, for the parents of all of our kids in the uh, Kids Bible Club. Uh, you'll notice uh, that we paid, we were able to pay the rent Sunday, uh, with the in, with the uh, uh, offering that came in, and uh, we're just about a hundred dollars short now of paying the August utilities. So if a hundred dollars comes in tonight, uh, I'll be able to send a check for the August utilities, and then we'll go back to working on uh, my support. Uh, we've done a great deal to catch up, and uh, special thanks to some. Some of you who reached in and picked up a couple of the cheap, the smaller bills and said, in addition to my regular giving, I'll, I'll pay this bill. And uh, there are a couple of small ones, $23, $16.83. And, of course, the phone bills get up to be a little bit uh, higher, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, so, anyway, uh, though that's the information for you uh, on that subject so much for that. Now, we have now completed the introduction and uh, chapter one in our study of grace, which was a definition and an explanation. And we spent quite a bit of time understanding what grace is all about and how glorious it is. Now, we're ready to get into the categories of grace, and the first one we shall see is pre-salvation grace, and that will include the doctrine of common grace and the doctrine of calling grace. Then we shall look at saving grace, which is grace which is related to the point of salvation, and we shall see there efficacious grace and the blessing of grace or the 40 things that God does for every believer at the point of salvation. That moves us then into the fourth area, and that is living grace. And living grace is divided into, first of all, logistical grace, which is God keeping the believer alive uh, in the devil's world and providing everything necessary so that he can uh, set his priorities straight. And then there is disciplining grace, grace which is designed to correct the erring believer. Then there is super grace or multiplied grace, which is all designed to provide the believer with special blessing for persevering uh, and to giving, making the priority to right decisions on a non-meritorious basis. Then we move to post-salvation, uh, to uh, uh, eternity future grace, or grace in eternity, and we have surpassing grace and we have rewarding grace. We'll also be studying orientation to grace, that is, uh, how it uh, 
grace is seen in relationship of one to another. We'll look at the antithesis of grace, which is legalism, and uh, see many of these things uh, as we move along. But right now, we're, we need to stop and we need to look at the pre-salvation grace, that is, the work that God does on the uh, basis of grace and grace alone, uh, for the person who is uh, totally depraved, but not uh, that we was spiritually dead, not only spiritually dead, but spiritually brain dead, meaning that this person is unable to understand anything which is spiritual. And uh, because of the finished work of Christ on the cross, God is able to do something for this category of individual. God can provide a fantastic salvation for these people. Um, now, uh, if you'll open your Bible, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, we're going to look at the doctrine of common grace, first from the passage of Scripture and then with a few categorical points which will come along with it. In John chapter 16, we have this fantastic introduction to what we call common grace. And if you're watching by television or listening by radio and you'd like to have the entire teaching, this book is available to you. If you'll drop us a letter, the address will be given at the close of the program. Uh, we'll be happy to send it to you. There's no charge of any kind, and nobody will put you on a mailing list to dun you for money later. No one will call on you since we do not have any kind of a program of visitation. It's simply available to you if you want the complete study on the doctrine of grace. Now, when we read this, I would say that probably every evangelist has taken and spoken on this passage of Scripture. However, it has been taken entirely out of context and it has been misused beyond belief. The Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to his disciples in one of the few passages which is found in the Gospels relating the, related to the church age, says, it talks about his leaving. Uh, and when he goes away, he says he will send the counselor or the helper, the uh, comforter, the advocate, the paraclete. Parakletos is the Greek word. And then he says uh, 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 that, uh, uh, verse 8, when he comes, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment. Now, let me uh, immediately state that this has nothing to do with personal sins. He is not going to come uh, the, after this, when he does come, which would be the day of Pentecost. He is not going to come to convict of personal sins. That is, the favorite sin of the speaker uh, or the evangelist whether it's booze or broads or bennies or whatever it may be, it's not what he's talking about. And because I am sure he anticipated it, he goes to, uh, into the very carefully uh, discussing what each of these three things is. And so in verse 9, he deals with the first of these things. Just to keep, I think many from uh, taking off on a tirade against whatever is their personal sin or whatever target they, uh, they seem to uh, enjoy uh, preaching against or whatever they perceive is the big sin of that congregation where they are. And so verse 9 tells us, in regard to sin, because men believe not in me. The point is very clear then, that the sin 
that is defined that the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to do under the principle of common grace, this is to remember to whom? To the unbelieving, the, uh, the helpless, hopeless, the brain dead, totally depraved person. Uh, he is going to give some information that this person would never know apart from the work of common grace. The work of the Holy Spirit is to give information that this person could never ever perceive or conceive of in his spiritually brain-dead condition. And the first the thing that he's going to make clear is the sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief or rejection of the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, John 3.18 is a passage that's very familiar to us, though we very rarely get to it because John 3.16 is so wonderful uh, that it seems to uh, stop us from going on. But in John 3.18, he says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's uniquely born Son. Uh, in John chapter 15, uh, verses 22, and again in verse 24, uh, he says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. See, he's not talking about uh, the, the sin of debauchery or the sin of drunkenness or the sin of immorality. He's talking about the sin of personally rejecting uh, who and what he is. Now, the word which is uh, translated... Uh, convict or convince in this passage is the Greek word elegko. Looks like this in the Greek. E L E G C H O. Elegko means to present or expose facts, to make facts very, very clear. To convince of truth, the work of common grace by the, by the Holy Spirit is in the very first uh, of all that God has intended to convince the person that he does not, at this point in time, have personal faith in the perfect person and the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the sin that the Holy Spirit makes clear or the fact that the Holy, of, the, of which the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, making clear when he comes in his work of common grace. Now you'll notice something that is missing that is so often talked about, and that is repentance of sin. There's a great deal of talk about Repentance. Now, repentance in its simplest form in the English does mean to turn around. But repentance is not an accurate translation of any Greek word that is used anywhere in Scripture. There is not even a hint of turning around. You see, here is a person, remember, who is totally depraved, spiritually dead, and brain dead. What can a person in this condition do to turn around his life? He can do absolutely nothing. He cannot even understand what it means. How, therefore, can he turn his life around? 
Now, the Greek word which is mistranslated repentance is this word. M-E-T-A-N-O-E-O. -E meta noeo. Noeo is the word for the mind and meta, a preposition, uh, meaning to change. The word means to change the mind. And that's all this word means. It doesn't mean to feel sorry. It doesn't mean to give up. It doesn't mean to turn from. It doesn't have anything to do with what the English word repentance uh, means. It's, it, uh, it, and, and it is tragically misused. I was quoting from uh, uh, a book entitled Grace Plus Nothing by Jeff Harkin. Uh, and uh, in his uh, book, he makes this statement, quote, Repentance in its simplest application means to turn around. It is typically understood in terms of turning away from sin. But the focal point of biblical repentance is the Lord himself. We turn from sin to the Lord. Only turning from sin to the Lord can save us from sin. He's totally wrong. That is a total impossibility. You not only cannot turn from sin, you cannot turn to the Lord. Had he understood the issue, he would never have even brought up this human work as having anything possible to do with grace. Now, for the, a good portion of his book, he is in focus. But in this one area, he makes a grievous error. <clears throat> and yours truly is going to address a letter to him and um, make a suggestion that he study what he's talking about before he makes such a statement because his book is receiving tremendous uh, uh, distribution uh, when uh, at first uh, no one would publish it so he published it himself loaded his car with it and went all over the country uh, with book uh, uh, selling it to bookstores so that they would then sell it and then it was picked up by uh, uh, one of the major book companies and they have published it in a very attractive form now and uh, it has a very tremendous acceptance. It is especially being used with uh, uh, addicts because he, he uses it to point out uh, something about recovery. For he himself was a recovered, uh, is a recovered uh, alcohol and uh, a dope addict, and he found out that when he tried to do it on his own, that he always inevitably went back to it. He, he tried, and he was clean for a year, for two years, for three years. But he always went back to it because he always cleaned up his life on his own. He never did it by grace. Once he found out what grace was all about, and he did it by grace, he has a tremendous testimony, and he has been uh, uh, traveling all over the country now, uh, pointing out the fact that you can be recovering uh, uh, if you... Don't do it by yourself, but as long as you're trusting in your human abilities, then you see the sooner or later the human ability will fail you. And so he's got the right point. He's got the right uh, uh, emphasis in, in a good portion of this. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have it for most, uh, for that one little portion, and he, he confuses the issue. But um, the point is that there is no place for repentance that the Holy Spirit is not convicting of repentance of sin. He is talking about a particular sin and the sin of unbelief or rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in John 16:10, we have the application or the uh, uh, information, uh, the amplification of the second statement. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, will, cons will uh, convince or, as I said, he will expose the facts regarding sin, uh, regarding righteousness. That's the second of the two subjects that uh, is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit under the point, uh, the principle of common grace. This is a reference to the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in crucifying the Savior, when the Jews crucified our Savior, they thought He was unrighteous that's why they crucified him because only a wicked person would be cursed and 
hanging on a tree. Galatians makes that clear in 3.13. But the resurrection, ascension, and session of our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated the fact that He was not unrighteous, but He was actually righteous. And so, he says, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Uh, no humanity goes to heaven without absolute righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated, therefore, His absolute righteousness by His resurrection, ascension, and session. And uh, this is the second thing that is going to be the subject of the convincing work or the convicting work or the exposing of the facts work of God the Holy Spirit. He convicts men of their faulty view of Jesus Christ as the truth of the gospel is proclaimed. Once again, the truth of the gospel must be made clear. The truth of the gospel must be proclaimed. It's not going to be made clear by what so many people are distributing or disseminating as what they call the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel is extremely brief. It is extremely clear. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead in His perfect humanity, bore your sins and mine in His own body on the tree. That He died and rose again, for, uh, died for our sins and rose again because of our justification. That is a brief statement of the gospel. And no matter what we do, we can't change the gospel. You may change the intro introduction. You may change the hook that catches people's attention. You may change the illustrations related to it. But you can never change the gospel. And I don't care how many times it is necessary for you to repeat the gospel. You can never have the right to change it, to make it so that it's a little bit more uh, uh, interesting to, the, to those who have heard it before. I think there is a great deal of truth to what the songwriter says uh, to those uh, uh, who've uh, heard it before uh, w seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest because it is the unchangeable gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the second uh, fa factor regarding the work of common grace by the Holy Spirit is the conviction regarding the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in John 16, 11, we have the third statement. When He, the Holy Spirit, comes, He will convince the world of unbelievers concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, when we talk about judgment, once again, He says, not, not that God is going to judge that horrible, terrible sin uh, of adultery that you're involved in or that terrible sin of debauchery or whatever it may be is the favorite sin of the person. No, no. He makes it very clear in John 16, 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The point is this, the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary was sufficient to judge and to judge completely the devil who had the power of death. Satan and his fallen angels are already uh, sentenced to the lake of fire, according to Matthew 25, 41. And all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will share the destiny of the devil. And the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to make this clear. All right, so let's understand a few subpoints now under the doctrine of common grace. One, the doctrine of common grace is the theological term for the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, in the presentation of the gospel. Two, now, whenever the gospel is presented or even recalled, the sinner, we'll use that term to describe 
the person outside of Christ, because of total depravity, spiritual death and spiritual brain death, cannot in any way understand it. First Corinthians 2, 11 and 14 says that it is foolishness to him. He's a soulish man, and it is foolishness to him. This means, point three, that no matter how intelligent, no matter how high the IQ of the hearer, because of this condition here, he is unable to comprehend spiritual truth. Therefore, God has four designed common grace in which God the Holy Spirit makes clear inside the soul of this unbeliever the truth of what the gospel is all about. Assuming that the gospel has been communicated. God cannot take uh, error and make truth out of it. He can take sometimes when some people muddy the waters and truth and error, and he can take the truth part and make that clear inside of a person's soul. But he cannot take error. He uses the presentation of the gospel uh, as it is performed by whomever to make clear inside the soul. The Holy Spirit uh, acts as a human spirit because this person who is totally depraved, spiritually dead, and spiritually brain dead ha is said to be dichotomous. Di meaning two, that is he has a body and he has a soul, but he does not have a human spirit. He, his body makes him conscious of what is uh, around him, uh, his soul makes him conscious of himself, but that's the limit of it. And he, he does not have a human spirit. So God the Holy Spirit must act as a human spirit so that he can understand spiritual phenomena, for it's the human spirit that makes him conscious of God and uh, the things of the spirit and the spirit life. So the human spirit is absent. No human spirit no comprehension. God the Holy Spirit acting as a human spirit now makes the gospel clear so that now this person can utilize his free will and volition to respond to the gospel. All right? Now, rejection of the gospel, of course, means everlasting punishment. There's no halfway house. There's no purgatory. And a person can't buy someone else out of... Out of uh, uh, death. All right. Uh, uh, where were we? F uh, five. So I thought. Point five. Therefore, common grace is the en the enabling power, omnipotence of God, the Holy Spirit, working inside the unbeliever to make it possible for him to comprehend the gospel. At the same time, the second work immediately goes to work, and that is the principle of calling grace or inviting grace, which is simply this, God the Holy Spirit extending God the Father's personal invitation to this person to believe on Christ. Romans 11:29 says, the calling of God is without repentance. And again, that's the English. The calling of God is never never changes. God never changes his mind. He always he always invites people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It never changes. It's also referred to in John 6.44 and in John 12.32 when the Lord Jesus Christ said that no man can come to God except the Father draw him. 
That is the invitation that is given by God the Holy Spirit is the invitation, the gracious invitation of God the Father to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that uh, it's found in Romans 11, 29, uh, indicates that it is for all, uh, that is, Jew and Gentile alike. Now, let me hasten to say that in this invitation, nobody hears a voice. You don't hear a voice with your audible ear. But they understand the issue. They understand. They do not need to have an invitation given by some evangelist or some pastor or someone else. When the gospel is made clear to them, they also receive the invitation from God the Father to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. At this point then, the spiritually dead, spiritually brain dead, totally depraved uh, sinner understands the gospel, perceives the invitation, and now he must use his own free will and volition. And that will be either to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or to reject Him. Thus, this grace is extended even before a person uh, is saved. This, by the way, m uh, takes place only in time. Once you have died, there is no second chance. There is no invitation which is extended. There is no common grace extended once you have died. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ during your lifetime, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Now, the usual reaction, and this is something we must understand, the usual reaction to common grace is rejection. It is not acceptance. The world is not sitting out there waiting for the opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us expect that, boy, if I just tell them the truth, they will just jump at the chance. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the doctrine of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. Romans 2.8.5-8 says, For those who are according to the flesh, the unsaved, set their minds on the things of the flesh, which is nothing but spiritual death. But those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the unsaved is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and blessing. Because the mindset of the flesh is hostile toward God, uh, it does not subject itself to God's law because it is unable to do so because of spiritual death. Therefore, those in the flesh because of spiritual death, cannot please God. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whom the God of this world system, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, Christ, who is the image of God. However, there are a few who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they're not saved yet. There must be something else, and that is the subject of the first of uh, the two points which are related to grace at the point of salvation. And the first of these is efficacious grace. Efficacious grace is simply defined as the necessary work of God the Holy Spirit in which he takes the non-meritorious faith of the person who is the believing sinner and makes it effective for salvation. If he didn't, nobody could ever be saved. God the Holy Spirit makes the believing sinner's faith effective for salvation. Remember, his decision originates where? Under spiritual death, spiritual brain death, total depravity. That's where the decision originates. Since it originates there, there, uh, there is nothing but human merit attached to this decision. 
Nevertheless, when God the Holy Spirit takes the decision and makes it effective for salvation, it rejects any kind of merit of any kind, makes it totally grace, grace all the way, and he makes that faith, non-meritorious faith, effective for salvation. At the same time, he, at that point, and we'll see it also part of the next uh, point, but he does this. Uh, in addition to this, he creates a new human spirit for this believing sinner. A human spirit. Now, having created a human spirit, he has created a target for the imputation of eternal life. And therefore, the creation of the human spirit is called regeneration. And God imparts eternal life to the human spirit. At the same time, uh, he places us uh, under the baptism of the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ, and we share his eternal life, so we have the double blessing of eternal life that comes. So here's how it works. Someone, a believer, may not be, but let's say a believer, communicates the gospel to the unbeliever who is over here. Being spiritually dead and spiritually brain dead, this person doesn't understand it at all. But God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, under the principle of common grace, that's a C, principle of common grace, now makes it clear inside the soul of this believer. At the same time, God the Holy Spirit issues the invitation to this person to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the person's human volition now goes, uh, clicks in. Non-meritorious uh, faith, uh, may or may not be extended but he uh, he who believes uh, on the son hath everlasting life he who has uh, does not believe uh, on the son does not have life but the wrath of God abides on him so says Ephes uh, John 3 verse 36 now even if he believes in Christ, he's not saved yet until the same Holy Spirit does the next work, and that is takes his positive volitional decision, his faith, and by, the, by means of efficacious grace, now makes it efficient for salvation. At this point, God the Holy Spirit creates a new human spirit inside of him, and God the Father causes this regeneration by the Holy Spirit to become the source of the imputation of his eternal life. Eternal life is now imputed to this person and he is said to be born again. He is said to be saved. He is said to be regenerated. Now, right here, there's a critical point. God the Holy Spirit cannot take erroneous response and make it efficient or effective for salvation. That is, this efficacious grace rejects believe and make a commitment. Efficacious grace rejects believe and turn from your sin. Efficacious gra grace rejects believe and be sorry for your sin. It rejects it re believe and make Christ the Lord of your life. It rejects believe and be baptized. It rejects believe and join a church. Uh, it, it rejects believe and have some kind of emotional experience. It rejects believe and raise your hand. It rejects believe and uh, come forward. It rejects uh, believe and make a public acknowledgement or public profession or public display. It rejects believe and invite Christ into your heart. It rejects all of these, and there are ten areas that are ten uh, spheres that are rejected by uh, efficacious grace. And all of these are heresies or blasphemies that it must reject. 
And uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, these are things that have all been added by legalism. Somewhere along the line, legalism has added one or more of these things to the matchless grace of God. Unfortunately, it's not efficient, never will work. Efficacious grace rejects it, does not convert that kind of positive volition into regeneration, does not convert that faith into salvation. This person remains lost until they come to the place when it is faith and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. We could add one more, Roman Catholic faith. Roman Catholic faith is not faith. There are that many of you look and say, well, our Roman Catholic friends are saved. They're not saved. No Roman Catholic is saved. They cannot be saved because there is nowhere in the church, or the Roman church, where they can ever hear the truth that salvation can come by faith in the finished work of Christ alone. They'll never, ever hear that. And if they believe in the work of Christ alone, they can never return to the Mass in which Jesus Christ is sacrificed at every Mass. He is placed on the cross. He is nailed to the cross. He is sacrificed again and again and again and again. Every Mass is a sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is totally heretical. And you cannot continue in that kind of a situation any more than the Jews of the Hebrews, uh, book of Hebrews, could continue to go back to the Old Testament sacrifices and slay the lamb and uh, say, yes, I'm a born-again believer. It's not possible to mix these two things. Roman faith is not faith. A person is lost. It is salvation by grace and grace alone. Let me give you the list of the ten things, that ten categories of salvation by works, which have been invented by legalism. One, verbal works. That is, including pseudo-repentance, making an issue out of sin, feeling sorry for your sin, inviting Christ into your heart. Two is commitment salvation. Commitment is, quote, an agreement or a pledge to do something in the future to assume some kind of an obligation. The totally depraved person cannot assume any kind of an obligation. Therefore, he cannot make a commitment. Besides, the Greek word pistuo, which means to have faith in to believe, has no connotation of commitment. Receiving Christ as Savior is not a commitment but a dependence upon the finished work of Christ. Thirdly, the third error is lordship salvation. At the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, whether you know it or believe it or not. No one can make Christ Lord of his life when he already is the Lord. Four, ritual works. Ritual works include baptism, circumcision, keeping certain holy days, observation of the Lord's Supper, or performing any other kind of ritual which is added to the sphere of faith in Christ. Five, Morality salvation. Morality salvation is an attempt to earn salvation by means of something one does, especially by keeping the Mosaic law. But it is all energy of the flesh and therefore rejected by uh, God the Holy Spirit under efficacious grace. Six, salvation by emotion. Uh, emotion is uh, uh, someone uh, having an emotional or an ecstatic experience. Uh, related to how he feels. I don't feel saved. Well, whoever said you had to? You know, nothing about feeling saved is ever given in the Word of God. It has nothing to do with faith. Uh, faith plus emotion cancels faith, and you stand on emotion alone, and you're lost. Seven, corporate salvation. Corporate salvation simply re refers to uh, joining a church or tithing or baptismal regeneration, such as is taught and practiced by the Church of Christ. Eight, Roman Catholic faith. Roman Catholic faith is to believe in penance, indulgence, mass, confession, and so forth. Adherence to certain kinds of rules and not whether a person trusts in Jesus Christ alone. Nine, the reverse invitation faith. Reverse invitation is inviting Christ into one's heart. A spiritually dead person has no ability to do that. It is an impossibility for him to... to uh, 
invite Christ into his heart. And Revelation 3.20 is written to believers, not to unbelievers. The opening of the door is, a, is comparable to uh, uh, 1 John 1, 9, we, what we call rebound. And tenth, psychological uh, salvation. Psychological salvation is always from the source of people who don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And they say, and I know I did it for many years, never could understand it, uh, but until I saw the light, uh, that is, raise your hand so we can pray for you. There's more uh, uh, error done under the, uh, the, into the concept of praying for uh, one another than anything else I've ever heard of in the, in the, in the church. Uh, coming forward, uh, talking to a counselor, uh, somehow uh, to make it clear. See, the counselor doesn't make it clear. Who makes it clear? God, the Holy Spirit, under common grace. If you believe in common grace, you make the gospel very clear, as clear as you can in human terms. God, the Holy Spirit, makes it understandable, not what some counselor can do. And so they get you uh, making, uh, then to, they say, uh, to misquote, mis, misinterpret Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10 has nothing to do with salvation. If you understand the context, you wouldn't put it there. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be safer with the heart man believe in the, uh, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. So they say, you see, you have to have faith plus make some kind of, a, uh, of an acknowledgement and that acknowledgement is when you come forward or you raise your hand or you somehow acknowledge that you're, can they have destroyed faith. It's faith plus nothing. It's a, some psychological hoop through which they get you to, to, to jump. And many times it's evangelists who want to be able to say that X number of people came forward at the last, my last set of meetings, so you need to have me come to your church so that I can get them coming forward. And they get them, anybody who has a mother will come forward eventually so they can get saved or whatever. And if they can't get saved, then they're going to get dedicated or whatever it may be. But the very nature of spiritual death eliminates any system of salvation by works because the spiritually dead person is totally incapable of performing any kind of work in order to obtain his salvation. Total depravity, total separation from God, total helplessness um, makes it impossible for this person to do anything. Now there's one exception, and that is those who never reach the age of accountability or those who, because of some kind of brain damage, are incapable of ever understanding. They're saved automatically by means of the same grace. But it's, it's, a, it's uh, the overruling grace of God that says there is no way that this person can ever comprehend, even under the work of the Holy Spirit, because they do not have the ability, the baby can't understand, there's no, there's no comprehension, or the moron, the the uh, some whatever the situation may be now some uh, uh, mental problems are they are able to comprehend others are not but uh, are the uh, always remember this that God's absolute righteousness and justice demands that God be fair with every member of the human race God will be fair when David lost that little baby uh, he's he said to the he said to, uh, uh, made this testimony. He said, he, he cannot come to me, but I shall go to him. It was very clear that he was going to eventually be one day with that babe in heaven because he was saved by the grace of God. Now, uh, we, this is a deductive thing. There's no chapter and verse for all of it, but on the basis of the deduction of who and what grace is, we can be sure that, uh, there is, uh, that they are saved. But for everyone else, there are the two points in life. One, the point of God consciousness, but believing in God does not save you. You use your volition to desire a relationship with this God. When you come to understand His uh, uh, Godhood or the fact that there is a supreme being and that He has power, uh, then uh, you exercise free will and volition. If you reject Him at this point, God is not obligated to give you one further bit of information. That's called the point of God consciousness. But if you go on positive volition, believing that there is a God and you want a relationship with Him, then God assumes the responsibility of giving you the gospel, and we call it the point of gospel hearing. And once again, you must exercise your free will and volition. And generally speaking, if you believed on God at this point and went positive, you would probably uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
when you hear the gospel. And at the point of hearing the gospel, once again, there are two uh, choices that you have. Uh, or or two, points, two points at which you use your volition. One, the point of deciding to hear the gospel. And secondly, the point of deciding uh, whether to believe or not to believe uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ. The spiritually dead person, uh, incapable of hearing apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, is absolutely and totally dependent upon the work of God, never on the work of man. The, uh, the man is privileged to be the one to disseminate the gospel, but the Holy Spirit does the work. And uh, so it is that uh, there are, and there are many, many passages of Scripture which I quote and will be uh, in the book for you. But uh, once uh, this has taken place, the God uh, bestows salvation upon this individual. And the second thing that he does is to give to this person 40 blessings of grace, and we'll take them up very quickly in our next class and move on into through through the doctrine of the grace of God and once again let me urge you to write for the book on grace God's middle name so that you can have the privilege and the opportunity of understanding this categorically point one point two point three have something in writing so that you'll know what this matchless grace is all about and if you're there listening or watching by television and you've never ever realized and what this was all about, at this point in time, I can guarantee that God the Holy Spirit has made the gospel very clear to you. And He has invited you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is your moment of decision right now. Whether you will believe or not is entirely up to you. He doesn't coerce you. He doesn't push you in any way. He leaves it entirely up to you. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit who made the gospel clear will take your faith and make it effective for salvation. God will do 40 things for you. You won't feel one of them. And you'll be born again by the Spirit of God right now in this moment of time. But you see, it's entirely up to you. You and you alone must make the decision. And so we, will, uh, we, we leave you with the Lord and with His matchless grace. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace and for all that it provides. May God the Holy Spirit help us to utilize these things and uh, to, dis to disseminate the gospel wherever we go, depending on the uh, uh, tremendous work of God the Holy Spirit, to take the gospel, make it very, very clear, and to continue his work in common calling and efficacious grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.